Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ. Okay, can a Christian be carnally minded? This is the intro. So before we go into it, I gotta say, I've been working on this study for a week, and I spent all the yesterday on it. Spent all yesterday evening doing videos. I started putting some out, but then took it back, deleted them, because God showed me some things that weren't right, and I was just really struggling. And like I said, I've, I've videotaped this study, and it was two, almost two hours the first time I taped it, and then I deleted it because something just didn't make sense. There are certain parts of Scripture that we will go over together because I was trying to get the Bible to say what I wanted it to say. And that whole thing about the lost world trying to get the Bible to conform to them, that's not me. I want to conform to the Bible. I'm a King James Bible believer. This is God's perfect written word in English. Okay. So I'm sitting and I'm thinking, and God's working through me, and He's like, you know what? Because I was going to make the video, like I said, be, um, can, a carnal Christ can a Christian be carnal? And then God told me that I'm looking at it all wrong. That's the trap. That's not the issue. The true issue, brothers and sisters in Christ, is can a Christian be carnally minded? Because God showed me some verses in there, and I'm like, this is pretty amazing. So, I videotaped this. This will be the third time, but only this time. The Lord opened my eyes. We're going to do multiple parts. And we're going to go through carnal. The word carnal and some of the books. So, I'm getting ahead of myself. So, the real question we should be asking is, can a Christian be carnally minded? Not, can a Christian be carnal? People should never be defending uh, carnal Christians, carnality. They should not be saying, you can be a Christian and be carnal. They should be saying, hey, the Bible says something, we're going to get to it, about carnally minded. Uh, there's a point where you can struggle with sin, and there's a point where you're carnally minded. Can you be saved and be carnally minded? All right. So, let's go over the basics, the facts. All right. Carnal, it's used 15 times in the Bible. 15 total times in the Bible. Three times in the Old Testament, and all three times is a reference to fornication. Okay. Uh, four times in Romans, uh, six times in Corinthians, and the Romans and the Corinthians are the two we're going to focus on, and two times in Hebrews, and it's talking about the, what is it, the carnal ordinances, the ceremonial laws, the things they had to do to, to cover their sins, you know. Um, so I'm not focused on Hebrews because it's written to Hebrews in the time of Jacob's trouble. It's talking about the old law trying to that the old law is a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, trying to point them to Jesus Christ. But I find it interesting that it's only for the Pauline epistles, it's only mentioned it's that's written for the church, I gotta say it right, written for the church, is in Romans and Corinthians. Uh, why don't you find it in Galatians? And here's another thing, it's only, it's only in Romans and Corinthians but only in one letter to the church, and one church is Paul writing to, that he's using the word carnal, and it's the Corinthians. You don't find it in Galatians. He's not writing to the church at Galatia, at Galatia saying, hey, you guys are carnal. You shouldn't be carnal. It's okay to be a Christian. You're still a Christian and be carnal. He doesn't mention carnal. Uh, Ephesians doesn't mention it. Philipp Philippians, Colossians, Thessalonians doesn't mention it. The letters to Timothy. Um, the book of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, it's not mentioned anywhere else. It's mentioned in Romans, and it's mentioned in Corinthians. And those are the two books we're going to face, uh, focus on in the series of studies. So, definition of carnal. One, pertaining to the flesh, fleshly, sensual, and here's the important part. It's opposed to spiritual. It's the opposite. Okay, carnal is the opposite of spiritual. It's opposed to it. It's not just the opposite, it's fighting it. It's oppo like an opponent. It's opposed to it. As carnal pleasure. Okay, Leviticus 8.20, uh, Leviticus 19.20, I'm sorry, 18.20, 19.20 in Leviticus. Those are the two references in the Old Testament. And the third reference uh, is Numbers 5.13. And once again, it's talking about the flesh. Um, that's actually talking about pertaining to the flesh, fleshly, sensual, as carnal pleasure. Like I said, it's talking about fornication all three times. 
All right, second definition, being in the unnatural state, unregenerate. All right, go to Titus 3. Let's turn to Titus 3. Titus is a small book. <laughs> I tend to accidentally pass it a lot uh, when you're looking for it. Titus 3.3. 3. Okay. And we're going to read all the way down to 7. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, deceived serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. The reason I sit, accent these things is we know a lot of ministries, brothers and sisters in Christ, where they preach hate. It's all about hate. Some ministries, it's all about deceiving people. Some ministries, like what we're going to learn in this Bible study, uh, it's all about teaching that you can have diverse lusts and pleasures and call yourself a Christian. It's no big deal. You can be a sinner all you want and call yourself a Christian. You know, That's why it says were sometimes. Um, verse 4, But after that the kindness of the love of God our Savior towards man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us by the washing and re regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which He shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by, justified by His grace we should be made heirs according to the hope of of eternal life. The key that we're talking about is regeneration. This is saying that carnal, one of the definitions is, is you're unregenerated, the natural state. In other words, carnal is used sometimes for lost people. Okay? We're going to go through that in Rev, um, Romans. Uh, we're going to be doing Romans chapter 7, the whole chapter in expository study, and we're going to go through half of chapter 8 in a different, like part 1, part 2 would be chapter... 8, or I'm not saying in that order, I think the Lord wants me to start with 8 and then we'll go back to 7. And then we're going to do a part 3 where it's going through the book of Corinthians together. Okay? Explaining the, carnal, the word carnal being used in Corinthians and why it's being used. And of course, a lot of people would stop there, but we're going to do a part 4 talking and encouraging the brethren on how to get carnal things out of your life so you can start pleasing the Lord. We're not just going to leave you hanging saying you're not supposed to have carnal things in your, house, in your life and you're just supposed to you know, get all these sins out of your life and then we don't tell you how and don't give you the tools how. Okay. So we're gonna, that's basically the whole series of this study is going to be about. It's talking about carnally minded versus spiritually minded. Okay, Walking after the flesh or walking after the spirit. So, and then the third definition of, uh, in Romans 8, 7 is the, is the example the Webster's 1828 Dictionary gives. And this is why I want to start with 8. The carnal mind is enmity against God. So right there it already gives us the answer. Can you be a carnal Christ, carnally minded and a Christian? No. But let's get to the verse, definition 3. Pertaining to the ceremonial law as carnal ordinance. That's what we're talking about for Hebrews 7.10 and 9.10. It's talking about the carnal ordinances. That's why it says carnal. I almost sounded like I said cardinal. Carnal ordinance. Okay? Now, after definition uh, 2, we realize it gives us the answer. But, we could end the study right now, but let's find out what is the difference between carnally minded and having carnal things in your life being carnal, because they said you can be a carnal Christian. Okay, we're going to look at it. Um, but what's the difference? Let's find out. And what is causing this movement that you can be carnally minded? Because when they say you can be carnal as a Christian, they're not saying that when you're newly saved, because I'm jumping the gun a little bit, when you're newly saved, you're going to have carnal things in your life. Your life is going to be a mess. Okay? Your life's going to be out of a mess. God is going to start working on your life. So when you start out as a Christian, you might be considered a little carnal because God's working on you. He's going to start showing you things. He's still showing me things today that, hey, why is that in your life? You know that thing you put out of your life, but you still didn't really get rid of it fully and completely? You know? So let's do this study and find out what's really going on here when it comes to this big whole carnal, de being a carnal Christian debate. Okay? So, um, 
Matthew 9.17, if you want to turn to Matthew 9.17. This in itself just is an eye-opener. A lot of people will probably read this and say, what's the big deal? A lot of lost people will. But um, even saved, I've gone over this so many times, and God just opened my eyes to it. Okay? This is Jesus talking, and he's given an example. So we're just going to use this verse so we can use it for today. Okay? Matthew 9.17 Neither do men put new wine in old bottles, else the bottle break, and the wine runneth out, and the bottle perish. Perish. But they put new wine in new bottles, and both are preserved. Now, I've read that a lot. I mean, you got context here. But think about this. Think something. I'm looking at the light. One of the lights I have to keep the shadows from moving everywhere is flickering a little bit. I hope it's not showing up. But the new wine, what does the new wine represent for what we're talking about? The law of the Spirit, when we get into, talk, get into the word hardcore, the law of the Spirit, which is in Christ Jesus, the evidence of that, that you have the law of the Spirit, which is in Christ Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit in you. So the new wine is the Holy Spirit. The old wine, law of sin and death, it's also the evidence of, oftentimes of another spirit. Okay? A worldly spirit. We'll say that, a worldly spirit. When you're lost, you have a worldly spirit. Okay. Now, let's go to the bottles. The old bottle is, is you being carnally minded, walking after the flesh. You're worldly. That's what worldly is. That's what choosing the world over God is. You're choosing to be carnally minded and to walk after the flesh. That's the old bottle. The new bottle is spiritually minded. Okay. You walk after the spirit. And the key word here is after. You walk after the Spirit. And as we learn in the Bible, when it says that, walking after the Spirit, or the law of the Spirit, which is in Christ Jesus, it's a capital S Spirit. It's talking about the Holy Spirit. When you walk after the Spirit and you're spiritually minded, it's because the Holy Spirit is running your life. He's telling you the do's and don'ts. This is a spiritual book. The Holy Spirit... Um, leads you and guides you into all truth. Okay. So, when you look at this and you think about it, what's going on today? Okay. You've got people that have the old wine and the old bottle. Now, they want to go to heaven. But what do they do? They think they can keep the old bottle and the old wine and just claim they have the new wine. The old bottle that has the old wine, it's old, it's cracked, it can't hardly hold any wine, and it's just basically getting to the point where it's worthless. It's already worthless, but you know what I'm saying? Because you can't refill it, it's worthless. So what do they do? Um, I want the new wine, but I don't want to give up the old wine, and I don't want to give up the bottle. So what do I do? I keep the old wine, I keep the old bottle, and I'll just tell people I have new wine in it. I'll just profess to have new wine in it. Isn't that what we're seeing out there, brothers and sisters in Christ? In order to have new wine, you have to, have to, have to, have, you have to have a new bottle. You have to be a new creature in Christ Jesus. The old man is dead. The old bottle is destroyed and it's gone. God destroys it and gets it out of your life. And he gives you what? A new bottle. And then what does he do with that bottle? He pours out new wine into it. He gives you his Holy Spirit. So you have all these people trying to keep the old bottle and old wine. And then they're trying to claim, well, I've got the new wine. I've got the new wine. Who are you to judge me whether I have the new wine in my old bottle or not? I mean, in my new bottle. And we're going to get to that. It's an old bottle, and when that old bottle starts shining through, what do they do? Matthew 23, Matthew 23, 27. Turn to Matthew 23, 27. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! 
for ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, outward, but are within full of dead man's bones and of all uncleanness. So what happens? Okay, they've got the old bottle, and they want to keep the old bottle, and they want to keep the old wine. So how do they hide this? This whole movement about you can be a carnal Christian, you can be a carnal Christian, you can have the world and be a Christian. What's really going on here? They're trying to keep the old wine. They want to be carnal, carnally minded. They want to walk after the flesh. They want to indulge in all these sins. So what do they do? They tell people you can't judge. You can't judge me for my sins and you can't judge whether I'm saved or not. Then they, what they do is they try to mask it by saying we have the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit. We have new wine in us when they don't. And when it gets to the bottle, what do they do about the bottle? They dress it up. They dress it up to make it look nice on the outside. Okay. Um, my house has uh, the aluminum siding. I don't know if they still do that anymore. My house is 30 years old. I bought an old house. Um, and when the wind blows, you can hear it creaking because it's an old house and I'm on the hillside and the wind can get really windy up here sometimes. But they have siding around it. You get these houses that are old, they're, they're a lot of upkeep money-wise, some of the houses just look horrible, and what do they do to mask it? They went and they put aluminum siding around the whole house to make it look new again and amazing. That's going on with these bottles, okay? These people that are false converts, they're on the way to hell, and they don't want anything to do with the real Jesus Christ, because if they did, they wouldn't want the old wine. They wouldn't want the old bottle. They'd want that new wine. They'd want to have a new bottle. They want to be a new creature in Christ Jesus. They want the Holy Spirit. They want to be spiritually minded. They're tired of being carnally minded. You come to God broken because you see how carnally minded and fleshly you walk after flesh, how sinful and wicked you are. And you come before God broken saying, Lord, I am so sorry for this. I don't want to be this way, but I see how I am. I'm on my way to hell, and I deserve to go to hell. Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. People don't want to do that. They want to be like, well, I, I want to go to heaven. I think it would be cool to be a Christian, but I want to keep my old bottle my old wine. You know a big example of this today? It started way back when, because we're going to find out here. All right. I have here with me two Bibles. They're both black. They're both red. Both of them, well this one kind of doesn't, but let's say it does, because some of them do. They've got the seven bands, you know, a seven seal book. they got the, the red on them, okay. They're both Bibles. Right? You open this one up, it's printed in New York, 1943. We open this one up. Well, you know, it's printed in New York. Now on this one, I had a hard time because some of these are so old, Bibles that I collect, they don't have a copyright in it. They don't have a date that it was made. You know, That's how old some of these books are. I'm going to look in the back real quick. They never are in the back, but like I said, some of these books that I get are very old. They look exactly the same. You know, kind of like what we're talking about here, the bottles. These are two bottles that look the same. Now, when you look on the inside, that's why the Bible says, Believe not every spirit, but try the spirits to see whether they are of God. You know, we're supposed to try the spirits. The spirits are on the inside. So let's open the inside again. This one says, The Dewey Bible House is where it was printed. This one says the American Bible Society. Okay. This one is a Catholic Bible. It's a house, not that I take this and say, it's so great. No, I'm just saying, I found a Dewey Rings that I can show people. Hey, if you don't believe what's on the online programs or anything, here it is in writing, the Dewey Rings. Okay. Well, they say it's the Holy Bible. This one, that's for, I forgot that part. This one says Holy Bible. But this one also says Holy Bible. 
Well, how do you know which one's true? You open it up. First of all, this actually says, what is it? At the beginning of each chapter, the second epistle of St. Thomas to Timothy. And one of them says uh, Catholic, you know. It actually says Catholic. Okay, we're in Acts. We're going to go to 2 Timothy 2.15. Oh, this one I already blocked for it. This one I had not. This is a King James Bible. That's a Dewey Reams Bible. So, this has a concordance in the back. Big one. A lot of this writing on these older Bibles, I mean, people's eyes had to be really good in, <laughs> way back when. Or they had to wear one of those magnifying seeing glasses because the words here are really small. I can read them. But it would hurt my eyes after a while. So, uh, Ephesians. Still not there. Here's Timothy. 1 Timothy. See, this one says the first epistle of Paul to the apostle, the apostle to Timothy. It doesn't say St. Paul. Okay. See, there's a lot of things you'll see in here. Okay, 2 Timothy 2 15. What does the King James Bible say? Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay, rightly dividing. Over here in the Dewey Reams, chapter 2, verse 15. Carefully study to present thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Not dividing handling. Okay? And there's so many other places, if we had time, I can go through this and show so many places where this is an error and it basically tears Jesus down, pre pre preaches every gospel possible except the true gospel, so you can believe whatever you want. Okay? That's what's going on with these bottles, okay? with people today professing to be Christians. On the outside, they're trying really hard to look the same as us, Bible-believing Christians. But when you look at their life, how they live their life, out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks, you start looking for the Holy Spirit in them, and you start realizing there's another spirit there. It's not the Holy Spirit. So, like I said, this is going to be a, a good study, and if you guys come across anything in this study, uh, make comments in the section. Fellowship. Say, hey, this also applies, or what about this verse? I love that, being able to fellowship with people in the comment section. And sometimes I like correcting people that try to tell me I'm lost and that I'm a heretic and you have no clue what you're talking about. People will throw verses out there, see this proves you're wrong. And I have to keep telling them time and time again, you have to keep going. You don't just grab one verse, you go through and get the context. Because when I kept going and adding the verses afterwards, it proved me right and it proved them wrong. And there's times I got corrected and I was wrong. So that's what's going to be going on here. Part 1, I think I'm going to do 8. Part 1 is going to be Romans chapter 8. Okay. Part 2 is going to be Romans chapter 7. Part 3, we're going to be going through the book of Corinthians, 1st and 2nd, when it comes to carnal. Getting all the, to talk about all the carnal things. Uh, to get the context of what carnal is, and what it means. And why the Corinthians are so messed up. Okay. And the fourth part of this series, we're going to be talking about how to overcome sin. Okay? And whose responsibility is it to help the younger Christians, the babes in Christ that just get saved and their life is a total mess still? Because we don't preach that you clean up your life and then get saved. We preach that you come to God as a broken sinner having sorrow for sinning against Him. You believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. If you don't truly repent, you can't believe in the real Jesus Christ. There's a Jesus that's going everywhere. I've done a study on that. Okay? Confess both in prayer to prove that you're not ashamed, and then you ask God to save you. God looks at the heart, and if the heart's right, He saves you. Then, God starts to clean up your life, okay? We mature Christians that have been through it are supposed to be helping the, the babes in Christ, saying, hey, this is the mistakes I made, hey, here's what God's Word says, this is what will help you, here's some encouragement, here's some correction, you know what I'm saying? You don't just leave someone hanging. I led you to Christ. Okay, get out of the way. Next, next, next. Oh, look, I, saw, I, I led 50 people to the Lord this year. 
Well, how many of them did you minister to? Show them the Bible. Show them how to study the Bible. I'll do this, in, I'll do this again in uh, the last part of the study. But tell them, hey, get a Strong's Concordance. You can get a computer program. I use a computer program, but I always push, have a hard copy. What happens when the internet gets shut down? I don't think it will, but you know, your internet goes out. Or you can't afford the internet. Or the power goes out for a few weeks, and you still want to do Bible studies. Here's a Webster's 1828 Dictionary. Believe it or not, without the computer and power and everything, these two books, along with this book right here, the greatest book ever written, the King James Bible, that's all you need to do Bible studies with the Lord. It's all you need. So, I'm going to try to do some of these studies outside. I was able to get the printer to print out Romans 7, but it's fighting me. Right now it says I'm almost, I'm like completely out of black ink. So I've been trying to do it in, I've been trying to do it in red, I don't know if that can say. Because it just seems like all the color ink, I got tons of that because I don't really print anything in color. I'm only printing notes that are in black. So... That's basically what we're going to be going through, so I'll be trying to get out in the next couple days. I'll try to get out part one, which will be Romans 8. Uh, Romans chapter 8, we'll go through half of it together. And um, like I said, God's just been showing me a lot of stuff. And the biggest thing I was struggling with is I was trying to get the Word to say what I wanted it to, and it doesn't. And my heart, you know, well, one of the things we're talking about, fleshly minded, means you try to twist Scripture and get it to say whatever you want it to say. Spiritually minded it eats at you when you try to make the Bible say something it doesn't, and it just it gets to you, and you're like, okay, Lord, I'm sorry. I was trying to push something. I surrender. Show me what it really means. And God, God showed me. I need to stop and start fighting. What, can you be a carnal Christian? And it's not about that. It's about can you be carnally minded in a Christian. And once God told me that, and I surrendered and stopped trying to do things my way, started doing things God's way, he opened my eyes and showed me a lot. So we'll be going through that. So I will see you in the first part of this studies, Romans chapter 8.